last concept in unit three, energy flow. I know this has been a mega size unit, but it's lots of important information so that we can understand how energy flows, how it goes from the sun to plants to us into a form that we can use it in. So now we're hitting the second half of that equation. Remember, all energy, remote, almost all energy is, is beginning in the sun. You and I can't go outside and sunbathe and absorb that energy into a usable form. But plants have chloroplasts with thylakoid membranes with chlorophyll. And chlorophyll is a pigment that can absorb sunlight. So plants do photosynthesis and convert light energy, that sunlight, into chemical energy in the form of glucose. Then consumers like you and I, we either eat plants or we eat other animals that have eaten plants and we ingest glucose in those forms. And now we're going to talk through cellular respiration, how your body takes the chemical energy stored in glucose and the foods you eat and breaks it down and converts it into ATP, which is the usable form for your cells. Remember, ATP is the main energy currency of the cell. It's like cash money. Glucose is like a check and ATP is like cash. And so we're going to figure out how it's made in a sense today. So the overall goal is to convert the chemical energy in the food you eat, like glucose, into chemical energy stored in ATP. Remember, think back all the way to unit one when we learned about the macromolecules. The carbohydrates you eat are our first source for energy and, and for making ATP, but any of the foods you eat can be processed or broken down as a source for energy. The chemical equation is the recipe that represents the whole process. And it is the opposite of photosynthesis. It's six, C6H12O6 plus 6O2 is going to make six waters and six carbon dioxides, and it's going to release energy in the form of ATP. Now, some teachers do not want you to write energy in the equation. So if you're listening and I'm not your science teacher, make sure you know what your science teacher wants you to write. I'm fine with it either way, um, but it's just something to consider. So let's break this down. That equation looks familiar. That's because it's the opposite of photosynthesis. Exactly. The reactants are your ingredients. And they, the reactants in cellular respiration are glucose and oxygen, which is what photosynthesis makes. The products are your results. And that's carbon dioxide and water, which are the reactants in photosynthesis. So I remember this one because I think, okay, what are the two things that all humans, what do we need? We need food and we need oxygen to breathe. So we eat and we breathe. All right, what do we make from that? You breathe out CO2, you pee out water, and then hopefully you get a lot of energy from it in the form of ATP. Again, energy is released in the form of ATP from this process, but technically it's not like considered a product. So your teacher may not want you to write energy or ATP in the product side of the equation. So let's just keep that in mind. So just like in photosynthesis with the chloroplast, the cellular respiration happens in the mitochondria, and it has two parts as well. It has the inner membrane, which is um, folded membranes, also known as cristae, and it has the mitochondrial matrix, which is the fluid-like substance that fills up the space around it. Now, cellular respiration basically has two steps as well, but it has this special thing I like to call the pre-step, which is glycolysis. The first thing that's going down, but again, I like to think of it as the pre-step. It's the breakdown of glucose. It is a 10-step process, so it's complicated. It's, we're going to take that six carbon molecule of glucose, C6H12O6, C6, that's six carbons. We're just going to split it in half, and we're going to make two three-carbon molecules called pyruvates. And this doesn't even happen in the mitochondria. We're not even there yet. That's how pre this is. It's going down in the cytoplasm, and it requires no oxygen, which means it's an anaerobic process. That means without oxygen. It's going to make a net of two ATP and two NADH. So remember, I told you there are other energy-carrying molecules like ATP. ATP is just the main energy currency of the cell. We learned about NADPH in photosynthesis. Now we're going to learn about NADH, and then another molecule is going to come up a little bit later. But it's important that we keep track of what we're making here energy-wise. So 
One glucose makes two pyruvate molecules and it charges up four ATP, but it's going to use two to get the whole thing going. So that's why I said it's a net of two ATP, just to break that down a little bit more in case you look at a textbook or something and you're like confused why it says four. It's a net two uh, overall. Okay, after this pre-step of glycolysis, the cell has to make a decision. If there's oxygen, it's going to go through aerobic respiration to get energy. If there's not, it's going to go through anaerobic respiration, which is also known as fermentation. So first, we'll talk through aerobic respiration when oxygen is available. It's a two-step process, just like photosynthesis. And the first step is the citric acid cycle, which is also known as the Krebs cycle for the guy who figured it out. The purpose is we're going to make electron carriers, NADH and FADH2, um, that are going to move on to the ETC which is the second stage. And the location is, is this gonna go down in the mitochondrial matrix, so the fluid part of the mitochondria. This is an eight step process, so eight chemical reactions basically, where two pyruvate molecules from glycolysis are gonna be chemically converted to make two ATP and some NADH and FADH2. Um, you don't need to worry for my students about how many of those two um, electron carriers or energy carrying molecules, I'm not worried about that. CO2, carbon dioxide, gets produced as a product. Details. Now, I'm not going to make you know all eight steps, but I do want you to know that the pyruvates from glycolysis get converted into acetyl-CoA, and that is going to be what enters this cycle. NADP, or excuse me, NAD plus and FAD are going to act as electron carriers, and they will become NADH and FADH2 when they pick up those electrons and those hydrogens and carry those into the final step. And this happens two times. So just like the Kelvin cycle happens twice to make glucose and photosynthesis, the Krebs cycle is going to happen twice. Um, each time it's going to take one pyruvate, it's going to make four NADH, one ATP, one FADH2, and three carbon dioxide. So once we've done it twice, we get eight NADs, two ATPs, two FADs, I call them NAD and FAD, and six CO2, if you're keeping track of the numbers here. The second step is the electron transport chain, which is also known as oxidative phosphorylation, and it's a chemiosmotic process, so some people will refer to it as chemiosmosis, if you remember that term from concept two, which is basically just a term that's combining electron transport um, down a concentration gradient from high to low in order to make ATP. Because that's what we're going to do in this step. We're going to make ATP. And we're going to do it in the inner membrane of the mitochondria, which is also called the cristae. So, again, it's a series of chemical reactions, shocker, that are using electrons and hydrogens that NADH and FADH2 brought over um, from the Krebs cycle or the citric acid cycle. And the enzyme ATP synthase is here and it's gonna help assemble ATP. The final electron acceptor after the E have gone down the ETC, after they've bounced down that transport chain is gonna be oxygen. And it's gonna combine the electrons it got from the NADH and FADH2 with hydrogen ions and it's gonna make water. So this step in summary is gonna make 34 ATP if it works perfectly, and it's going to make water when those hydrogens bond to oxygen. It's so important that you know that the most ATP is coming from this step right here. And so this is a beautiful picture of um, what is happening in this cycle and how we're using the NADs and the FADs and how we're using some ATP to make more ATP. Um, I love that it shows how where the citric acid cycle is happening in the mitochondrial matrix, and then it shows how the electron transport chain is happening across um, this membrane into the um, in the cristae of the mitochondria. But again, remember, I only need you to know, we're just knowing a couple things. You don't need to worry about all these details, and I would never, ever um, make you draw this. But I do love that this diagram also points out that this is happening in plants and animals because plants have mitochondria too, and they need um, energy in the form of ATP as well. So it's happening in both. So I hope when you were listening to all of that, you started thinking, dang, there are a lot of similarities between photosynthesis and cellular respiration. And it could get really confusing really easily because a lot of the similarities are actually like opposites, like the reactants of one or the products of another. And so what I want you to do right now is I want you to pause this video 
and I want you to go and I want you to do page 34 in your packet and I want you to try to figure to organize this information. If you're a visual learner like me, I really suggest color coding it as well. Um, and then it can be gone through here and make sure you got it all. Okay, I wanna circle back because we said that after that pre-stage of glycolysis, the cell has to make a decision. So if it doesn't have enough oxygen to move on to aerobic respiration, but we need ATP, it's going to do anaerobic respiration or fermentation. And there are two types of this. There is lactic acid fermentation and alcohol fermentation. So lactic acid is what's happening in you. Um, it occurs in some bacteria and animal cells like yours. We are animals. Pyruvate, those pyruvates from glycolysis are going to go through a chemical reaction and they're going to be converted into lactic acid and then we're going to get two ATP from this process. Alcohol fermentation is going to happen in yeast when oxygen isn't available for them. They're going to take those pyruvates from glycolysis and break them down into alcohol, carbon dioxide, and 2 ATP. Now notice, I don't need you to know a lot of details about this because what I care about for my students is that you really understand the big picture here. In aerobic respiration, if everything works perfectly, we can get about 36 to 38 ATP from one glucose. That was the two that we netted from glycolysis, two that we got from Krebs cycle, and then about 34 from the ETC. But again, that's only if everything works perfectly efficiently. Anaerobic respiration, we're only getting like two to four. Two that we got from glycolysis, and then another two from either lactic acid fermentation or alcohol fermentation. So the key here is that you see the vast difference and how important it is to have access to oxygen on a regular basis, or else we're not going to be able to get nearly enough energy for our cells. Okay, one last little visual I want to give you to help you summarize and organize this information. We're going to look at a chloroplast and a mitochondria here. So photosynthesis takes in light energy and it takes in carbon dioxide and stomata. And it's going to take those carbon dioxides and make glucose and it's going to take water and make oxygen from it. Cellular respiration happens in the mitochondria. It's going to take that glucose and make carbon dioxide, that oxygen and make water and it's gonna release energy in the form of ATP for, that is usable for your cells. So that is how on a cellular level, we go from sunlight to glucose, to you eat an animal or a plant that has that glucose to break it down and to get it to ATP, which is a form that your cells can actually use it in.